everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and uh, my guest today is a friend, fellow YouTuber. Uh, he's a husband and a father and a fellow believer in the Lord, Will Perry. Welcome to the show, Will. How you doing? I'm doing really well, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, my family, everybody's caught uh, a sickness once again, so uh, everybody's, oh. you know, we're, we're doing well. We're doing all right, yeah. so I, I definitely can't complain. Thank you so much for having me on again, my brother. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know we've talked a few different times on each other's channels and just um, related back and forth talking about different issues we're going to be talking about. Uh, well, we talked about something. Uh, well, we've talked we've talked about several different issues. Uh, people can check out on one way or another. But why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? I know sometimes we miss the forest and the trees, as it were, uh, about how people come to Christ. Right? <clears throat> sometimes people are... Um, you know, grow up in the church or they're not, or they didn't really understand their faith or who Jesus is until much later. Uh, why don't you just share your testimony and just, uh, you know, be as de in depth or as uh, short as you like. So go ahead. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, brother. Uh, I have a video on my channel. Of course, my name is William Perry. You can call me Will, uh, or you, you can call me the bottom line dad or bottom line dad. However, you just don't call me late for dinner. But stupid dad joke. I had to throw that in there. Uh, with a channel that has the name dad in it, I have to I have to throw these silly, uh, superficial dad jokes in there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a I have a video that's about, I think it's about 45 minutes long or so on the channel, uh, just talking a bit about my testimony. So if anybody wants to check that out, definitely feel free to go check that out. I'm going to try to hit the bullet points. Um, so gosh, where to start? So it's it's a long story. Basically, uh, I was born in 1985. I grew up in a military family. My biological dad was in the army. Uh, he was abusive towards my mother. Uh, he was not a good dad. He was cheating on my mom. Uh, he beat my mom. He punched my mom when she was pregnant. I have a brother who is buried. He was far enough along to where he was actually fully mature and ready to be born. And my dad punched my mom in the belly and broke his neck and he was still born. He was born dead. And uh, so anyway, gosh, uh, uh, being military, I lived probably, I think in two or three different continents, uh, multiple different states. By the time I was seven years old, we lived in Germany. And that's when I came to know the Lord. A lot of people scoff at that. I know a lot of people. I think Justin Peters, I love Justin Peters. I appreciate his theological takes. I agree with him on a lot of what he says. Uh, but I think he even wrote a book, if I'm not mistaken, maybe I'm mistaken. But, uh, you know, a lot of people scoff at that. They hear, you know, you come to faith at seven years old. What do you know as a seven-year-old? You know, you don't know anything as a seven-year-old kid. You're immature, et cetera, et cetera. But I know that I know that I know that I came to know the Lord in a solid Christian church when I was seven years old in Germany. Uh, flash forward about a year, we came to the United States, and my mom finally built up the courage to, like I said, she, my biological dad was cheating on my mom. He was abusive. And she got up the courage to divorce him. And so she divorced him. This was about 1992, 1993 or so. And uh, we, my sister and I, uh, my mom actually had a, a couple of miscarriages. Uh, I think it had to do with a lot of the abuse and, and that sort of thing that was going on. Um, so it, basically, it was my mom as a single mom uh, and my sister and I, and we were poor. I mean, we grew up in the ghetto. And that's why, you know, a lot of times when I hear these stories of quote unquote white privilege, I'm just like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> I, where was that? I don't know what yeah. that is. Like what I, I, you know, you know, I have a picture here. Um, I don't know if uh, you want to bring it on or not, but uh, yeah. this was about a, a Christmas time. And I mean, we didn't get much, like I said, single mother household. And that's my sister and I were sitting at the breakfast table and we have our coats on. We have as many uh, hot weather clothes on as we possibly can because my mom couldn't afford heat. I believe mm. if I'm not mistaken, we had a propane tank that supply the gas to supply us with heat my mom we were broke we were poor and living in the ghetto and we could not afford to to heat up our house too well so and if you notice that's uh that is uh christmas gifts right there we had like one or two things and we were happy with that because we saw how hard my mom worked mm. um wow. and so i i was a a, a christian i was committed 
Christ follower, as a disciple of Jesus, I truly believe that I know that I know that I know that I was saved. Um, however, the problem, I think, with coming to faith at a young age, the problem with professing Christ at a young age is that you are immature. I think there's multiple levels of, of maturity, right? So there's spiritual maturity, and there's also uh, physical, mental maturity, right? So if you're seven, you're still a seven-year-old kid. You know what I mean? Um, if you're you you come to know Jesus, you, you profess faith in Christ, and it's you're truly regenerate as a thirteen-year-old. Well, you're still mentally and physically immature as a thirteen-year-old, right? So you know you could have a forty-five-year-old grown man who comes to faith in Christ, and he's spiritually immature, mm -hmm. uh, but he's physically and mentally mature. He's a grown man, right? And so I, I think with my biological dad being out of the picture and not really having a father figure, not really having good discipleship. Now, my mom would take us to church uh, as often as she could, and I am so grateful for my mom. My mom would always drop uh, little nuggets of, thank Jesus, thank God, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for God, you know, and that sort of thing. And then, like I said, I think it was a great thing because it, it humbled us, you know, it was, it was something that my sister and I both looked at and we saw, we saw how hard she worked. We saw the multiple jobs that she worked just to put food on our table and we were so appreciative for that and my mom was never down she was never gloomy she was never depressed about it she was always about jesus she was always about church i mean in the midst of all that she was praising god you know and i saw that you know and even though I didn't have a dad, I didn't have a father figure in my life. I had, I had the Bible. I had the Holy Spirit. I had, you know, and I remember memorizing my my small little King James Bible um, that I had, my King James Version <laughs> translation. I remember memorizing Psalm 23 just because I wanted to. Um, again, I, I do now. I'm not the most charismatic uh, Pentecostal guy on the planet for sure. I'm not that guy that's all up in my feels and all about emotionalism and that sort of thing. I'm absolutely not. At the same time, I do believe that God does move. I do believe that God does work. Um, and I do believe in God, the Holy Spirit. And so I, I do think and I do feel that I was I was led on and encouraged by God to memorize scripture. I remember specifically memorizing Psalm 23. I did not attend Awana. I did not uh, have that discipleship in my life. I did not have that father figure. My mom was working multiple jobs. Uh, like I said, we were broke and I mean, <laughs> hardly can afford heat. And so mm. I remember memorizing the Lord's Prayer in, in Matthew chapter 6, starting around verse 9 or so. Those were like some of the first passages of scripture that I remember memorizing. And this is as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, uh, 10, etc., etc. And as I was growing up. And so long story short, uh, my mom met my stepdad, who I absolutely love. I look at my stepdad as my dad. Um, mm -hmm. He's a great guy, uh, but also full-time active duty army. Uh, and so, gosh, this was, I was probably 15 or so. This is around the year 2000 or so is when they got married. Uh, now, flash forward to 2001. Everybody remembers what happened in the year 2001. Uh, it was Tuesday, September 11th, uh, 2001, and that was 9-11, right? The Twin Towers were knocked down, planes flew into them, the Pentagon, et cetera, et cetera. I was a sophomore in high school at the time. And my mom had been married to my stepdad for now. My stepdad's a believer. He loves Jesus. He, they go to church, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I, I, gosh, I had about two years or so maybe of having that dad, having that good godly uh, man in my life as a, as a father figure. And anybody that knows anything about the military around 2001, right after 9-11 or so, knows that people were deployed like all the time. I mean, if you were in the military between 2000 and the end of 2001, and I would say probably about 2008 or so, 2007 or so, um, gosh, at least till 2005, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, those four or five years, I mean, if you were in the military, you were deployed. And, and I mean, you were deployed nonstop all the time. And so um, true story, uh, sidetrack here, true story. It, it, the day that my mom married my stepdad, the very next day, uh, and I think they got married, I want to say in 1999-ish, 
1999, 2000. Um, he actually went to Korea. And mm. so, you know, it's, it's funny, the things you don't think about when you're younger. Uh, now as an adult, I'm thinking, well, I'm sure they dated for a little while. Maybe they thought, okay, well, you know, I'm going to have to be deployed to Korea. Are we going to get married and get the benefits and, you know, stay connected or not? You know, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I would imagine that conversation probably took place. And so it, as soon as they got married, um, he deployed to my stepfather and deployed to Korea. He was there for a year. He came back and, and like I said, we moved to round about uh, your parts, your neck of the woods, um, Fort Campbell. And oh, yeah. so we moved there. And like I said, with that's 2001, 9-11 happens. And he's basically deployed for much of the time. And I, I'm getting to a point here. So the, the basic point is that uh, a lot, a vast, vast majority of my life, I grew up without a, a, a father figure. And I love my stepdad. I totally do. Um, you know, my biological dad, I love him too. Um, that's a whole separate issue, whole separate story that I can wax long about that I won't get into. Um, right now but uh basically ah, gosh you know the discipleship wasn't quite there right mm. so as a dad i disciple my kids i i'm you know that's what i do i do it every day we pray um you know i tuck them in at night we do our little bible time <laughs> we do a journal time i let them write in their little journals and whatnot um and it's a great thing but that's one of the things that i miss so you know as growing up as a, a christian I, I was a committed believer um i trusted in jesus i would pray every day on my own um i would pray i would read my bible and that sort of a thing and but I was very, very, very spiritually immature, and I was immature just in general. I mean, you're talking, I, I came to faith. I truly believe I, that I know that I know that I know that I was saved um, at, at seven years old. I, I came to faith, and, you know, over the years, you know, teenage years and, and moving on, um, not having a father figure, not having real good, solid discipleship. I was immature physically and mentally, and I was immature spiritually as well, um, mm -hmm. I think. And so uh, eventually I graduated high school. I myself joined the military. Um, I joined the army as an x-ray tech, and I went to Fort Sam Houston, Texas and San Antonio. And then I went to Fort Benning, Georgia for what they call my phase two assignment, where I went to a hospital for the army, excuse me, I trained and, and did all that sort of thing. And uh, I was an army reservist for most of my career after that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, eventually I met my wife and I started going to a church where I really started getting, I would say, discipled in. It was a church that was really big on discipleship. It was a church really big on the Bible, a church really big on, you know, um, learning the word of God and staying connected with people and having like mentorship type of things, men's Bible studies and that sort of thing. Elderly people that would look down on me. I, I, that's a bad way of phrasing it, not look down on me, but would take me kind of under their wings and say, Hey, William, sure. how you doing, brother? You know, yeah. um, what, what problem, what can I pray for you about? What, what can I help you with? And et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, I was working at a level one trauma center. Uh, this is in Richmond, Virginia, uh, and going to church. And I met my wife. Eventually, we got married and we had children. And uh, I got involved in prison ministry. And uh, now when I met my wife, she was a, a surgical tech. Uh, so she, you know, me being an x-ray tech, I would operate the, the C-arm is what they call the equipment. It's a big looking C thing. And it's basically fits in between the operating room bed and the patient. So as an orthopedic surgeon is like nailing a, a, a femur or <laughs> is nailing a nail in somebody's broken uh, femur, um, I'm taking x-rays. So they they can follow it along and see where the screws are and whatnot. And my wife is the person who is handing the surgeon the scalpel and the nail and all that sort of a thing. And so uh, my wife has since, man, I, I love my wife. I am I'm so blessed by God's grace. It's I am a sinner saved by grace uh, and it's nothing but God. Um, you know, and I, and I would have to remind people that salvation is the power of God uh, to all those who believe first to the Jew and also to the Greek, the, the Gentile, to 
everyone who yeah. believes Romans chapter one, verse 16. And so uh, I'm saved by grace through faith, uh, grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone. It's not my own merit. It's not my own doing. It's not my own works so that I cannot boast. It's a free gift of God, right? Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. And so, man, I'm, I'm just, I continue to be amazed and amazed by the grace of God. Um, I like the acronym God's riches at Christ's expense. I fully believe in that. It's all God's work, um, you know. And, and I've I've matured. I've gotten older, <laughs> mentally and physically. I've I've matured, uh, but spiritually, I have matured so much since that since those young days. Um, and I I wouldn't take back any any of my experiences and that sort of a thing. And and uh, you know, like I said, my my wife has moved up from being a she went from being a a surgical tech to being a nurse in the OR in the surgery in the operating room. Um, and then she went to be a charge nurse and then she went to be a nurse manager. Now, mind you, I was working four jobs or so. I was working as an army reservist. So I was mm -hmm. in the army still. Um, you know, I would do the one week in a month, two weeks a year, which I put that in scare quotes because that's not true. <laughs> you know, you might see this commercial, you might see the commercials. I don't know if they still have the commercials anymore. I, I don't watch too much TV anymore, but I know when I was younger, it was, you know, the be all that you can be <laughs> in the yeah. army type of thing reserves. And then they would, they would tell you one week in a month, two weeks a year. Well, mm -hmm. for me, it was like, you know, a whole, a month, you know, it was like two months a year. And it was like, you know, uh, a week out of the month because the weekend ended up being, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, oh, wow. and the, yeah, <laughs> that's how it was for me in the army. I don't know anybody else's experience with it, but, uh, that's how it was for me. And then like, I went to, uh, at the time it was called PLDC. I think it later became WLDC. It was like Sergeant school. Basically. I think they've changed the name of it. They always change the acronyms, the army, but I was in the army, uh, working for them. And then I was working two part-time jobs at two different hospitals. Uh, and then I was working a full-time job at a level one trauma center, uh, hospital in Richmond, Virginia. So at the, at, at one time I was working four different jobs. Um, you know, eventually my wife was like, Hey, I, I need you. We started having babies. Uh, you know, my wife was like, Hey, I, I need you home more than, uh, more than we need the money right now. Praise God. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah. we're good financially. I need you. Um, so I had to quit the part-time jobs. Um, when my time came, I was in the army for eight years. Uh, when my time finally was up, um, and it was so funny because I thought I was done after six years, but the army, I, I, I signed a contract for eight years. So after six years, I was like, Hey, why is uh, the retention people? Why are they not talking to me? Like, I thought I was done. <laughs> They're like, nah, you, you still have two more years in the army. <laughs> oh, wow. So I was like, ah, all right. I, okay. <laughs> so uh, I was in the army. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Ready. I was ready to get out. I was, I was married now. I was, had kids. I was, I had other jobs and I was like, I'm done with the army. I, I, I've got what I got out of it. I love it. It was great. I'm done. Anyway, long story short, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to hit the bullet points. I'm, I'm skipping over a whole ton of stuff here for the sake of time. But, uh, you know, eventually it came to the point where I just had the one full time job. My mom, uh, my mom, goodness gracious, uh, my wife, uh, she worked. <laughs> that's terrible if she was. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, didn't mean that, babe. I love it. But uh, anyway, so my wife, she started um becoming a charge nurse and she started moving up the career ladder mm -hmm. and good for her. I was like, Hey, that's, that's wonderful. That's great. You know, um, I love being an x-ray tech. I love helping people. I love taking pictures of, of broken bones and chest x-rays and hearts and lungs and that sort of thing, whatever. Um, eventually my wife, uh, and, and so we, we were homeschooling our kids and eventually my wife was offered a job as a nurse manager. Uh, but in order for her to take a job as a nurse manager, she had to go full time and work throughout the weekdays. Well, we were left with the decision, OK, well, what do we do? Do do we put the kids in public school? Do we homeschool them? Do, what, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I you know, my wife and I talked about it. We prayed about it. And I was like, hey, you know what? Truth be told, um, you know, with your salary and with your career track, if you want to be a, a nurse manager and work full time throughout the weekdays, that's all fine and well. That's great. Go for it. You know, I'll support mm -hmm. you. That's wonderful. Um, praise God. You know, go for it. Apply. See if they hire you. 
good to go. Um, well, they hired her. And, <laughs> and so my wife became a, a nurse man manager and I stepped down from being full-time to being part-time. So we basically flip flop. My wife went from homeschooling our kids throughout the weekdays uh, and, you know, uh, me working throughout the weekdays full time to me uh, and her working part time on the weekends to me working part time on the weekends and my wife working full time on the weekdays. So then I ended up homeschooling the kids, which is totally change of pace to go, uh, excuse me, from uh, full time work to homeschool dad and that sort of thing. So that's what we did for quite a while. And then we moved. We eventually, uh, my wife worked her way up to where she is now a director of nursing. Uh, so she's doing well. She's continuing to move up her career ladder. She she loves what she does. And uh, we eventually moved to the state of Texas, where we now reside. And I, for the past year and a half now, I basically have just been a homeschooled dad, where I've homeschooled my kids. Uh, I haven't worked outside of home. And my wife has been working as a director of nursing. And that's where we are today. How old are your kids? Oh, man. So our our son is 14. Um, he is our oldest. He will be 15 in April. And then our daughter is nine, our daughters. So we have one son and we have three daughters. Uh, like you, okay. we have four kids. Yeah, um, and then so our son is 14. Our daughters are nine, seven and five. I had to think about it for a second, but <laughs> nine, seven and five. So nice. they'll all be older a little bit later this year so right on right on That's yes good. sir uh and so you've got um a channel so the bottom line dad they're on youtube i know you're on gab you're on twitter you're on all the socials <clears throat> um what brought you what made you want to do youtube and you know be a little bit more uh hands-on with with uh, social media and stuff I am so glad you asked that. That is such a great question because here, here's the thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. So I mentioned how for much of my Christian faith, for much of my, my life, I grew up without a, a father figure. I grew up um, lacking discipleship. Um, and when I finally got plugged in, as they would say, you know, as Southern Baptist, you know, you get plugged into your life yeah. groups or your Bible study groups or whatever it is. Do um, life. You got to do life. Yeah. <laughs> Grab Together. life by the yeah. horns. Yeah. This, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a pastor, right? So That's yeah. Right. Um, you know, and I appreciate whatever you, whatever you want to call it, life group, Bible study, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would not say that I had a quote unquote crisis of faith. I would, I didn't have a crisis of faith, but I will say this. I worked at a, a VCU health uh, is where I worked in Richmond, Virginia. It was a level one trauma center before I worked there. Um, I, like I said, I gave you the bullet points. Uh, the point that I'm getting at is that I, I worked around a lot of colleges. I worked when I was younger, when I was, co so when I joined the army, I was 18. Right. I, I didn't do super well in high school. Uh, I had my options were work and pay my way through college and community college, by the way, um, and get some sort of Pell Grants or whatever I could, whatever I could possibly get or join the army. And I was like, I'm going to join the army. <laughs> the army's going to pay me to do the school. This is what I want to do anyway. And, and to bullet point it. I experienced a lot of nurses. I experienced a lot of doctors. I experienced a lot of patients. I saw a lot of mess being in the medical field. And there were a lot of times where my my faith would be, uh, quote unquote, challenged, right? Uh, you would have people questioning my faith. And, and so I had a, a part, I would say, between the ages of, um, you know, and I never lost faith. I always remained faithful. I always would pray. I would always go to church. I would read my Bible and I trusted mm -hmm. in Jesus. And, you know, there were questions that I had because of the lack of discipleship, uh, because of um, what I think it was a, a lack in, in head knowledge. I, I think um, there were a lot of questions that for me went kind of somewhat unanswered. And mm -hmm. so I, I started looking. And like I said, it wasn't until I, I started attending this particular church where I really got discipled, where I really was like, okay, this is apologetics. This is what this is. Um, 
And I started reading all these different books. I started reading apologetics books, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, Frank Turek was one of those. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That was one of those that really, I start. I mean, I actually bought several copies of it. I gave that book to like multiple different people that I knew, my family members. Nice. Um, yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I just got really fired up for the faith. And uh, by God's grace, I had a coworker uh, who was like reading a lot of Ray Comfort and he was like handing out gospel tracts and that sort of thing. Him and I went to uh, a college in Virginia and we started handing out gospel tracts and sharing the gospel with uh, college students. Uh, I had an attack on, gosh, a spiritual attack on my faith. I had a lot of people who would say, well, that's not really true and that sort of thing. The Bible's not really the word of God and this sort of thing. And so from, I would say between the ages of, gosh, 20 and 20 three 24 or so i really was heavy into apologetics like i was reading the bible nice. um and i kept reading the bible all the way through like every single year but like the apologetics side of me was lacking and so i i, I would study up on apologetics i would study up on well here's why i believe what i believe um this is objectively true there's no this is undeniable this is objectively true this is undeniable this is what happened in history here's the reasons for you know first peter three fifteen. uh in your hearts uh, set apart Christ as Lord, always be ready to give an apology, to give a reason or an answer, a defense for the reason, for the hope that you have in you, uh, and do so with gentleness and respect, right? General gentleness and reverence, right? First Peter three fifteen, And so, um, I did that for several years and as I'm in this church, and this is why I think, uh, and you as a pastor, you know, this as well, uh, uh, people watching, hopefully they know this as well. Um, it's so important to get plugged into a, a local church or get involved in a local church. Maybe you don't say plugged in, but join a local church. That's yeah. so important because they can help disciple you. Matthew 28, the great commission, right? Go therefore and make disciples, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. Um, or I got involved in prison ministry as in prison ministry for five years about and i was just on fire for god and i'm still I, I love jesus and i don't know any other way to be so flash forward to 2020 now we all know 2020 uh covid uh we all know 2020 george floyd uh a lot of the social justice stuff started happening yeah. um, big time social justice um and so you know gosh for several years there were people there were pastors and, and preachers and teachers that i would listen to so you know, I, I'm a theology nerd. I, I love the Bible. I love listening to preach, preachers preach. Um, I love listening to biblical teaching. And so what I would do is I would listen to my pastor. He was like the guy that I, I if I, if I had a um, hierarchy, I'd be like, well, obviously Jesus, God, and the Bible. Um, but my pastor was like my local church pastor. He was like on the level. He was like, man, yeah. love that guy. Solid. I listen to him. But at the same time, I would also go to YouTube and I would listen to David Platt. I would listen to Matt Chandler. I would listen to all these other guys because I'm like, man, these guys are solid. I love these guys. These guys are preaching yeah. the word and they're on fire for Christ. Um, in my church, we would have um, different video series from Matt Chandler. We would have, um, gosh, what is it? The Secret Church from David Platt. We would have those teachings and that sort of a thing. And so... The year 2020 was a really bizarre year. It was one of those watershed moments where, um, gosh, I, I think the scales were kind of peeled back from my eyes because I know the Bible and I'm in prayer and I'm, I'm being as much of a disciple as I can be. And I'm being discipled and I'm making disciples and sharing the gospel at prison ministry and doing all these various things. And, you know, like I said, COVID happens and um you know, all this quote unquote social justice happened, George Floyd happens. And so I start seeing a lot of stuff happening in our culture. I start seeing a lot of stuff happen in society. Um, and mind you, during this time, I'm also doing children's ministry. So my wife and I, by God's grace, are having babies. Um, we are involved in children's ministry. I'm like, look, I, I, I give my kids off to these other people um, mm -hmm. to, to take care of. And I also want to minister and take care of these other people, kids, you know. And so I'm involved in um, vacation Bible schools. I'm involved in Sunday school classes for kids. And so, you know, I'm ministering with a whole ton of different people from all sorts of different perspectives, men, women, different skin color people, et cetera, et cetera. 
all of a sudden in the year 2020, um, this was, and, and it's like, this is God's providence. This is how I know, you know, God is sovereign. God is in control and in, in, in his providence, um, right around the year 2020 or so is when we moved, uh, later in the year 2020 is when we moved to, um, Texas. And so during that time, obviously I'm not working outside the home. Um, and so obviously in God's providence, I have a little bit more time to spend in thought and prayer mm -hmm. and reading the word. Uh, and so gosh, I started seeing on social media, on Facebook, I started listening and hearing and getting text messages, phone calls from various people that I ministered with. I'm talking in prison ministry, I'm talking in children's ministry, and people saying things like, you know, because I'm white, I'm part of the problem. Because I'm white, I'm privileged, and I'm the oppressor, and these other people, I feel bad for them, and, you know, racism is so super horrible in our country, and, you know, again, bullet pointing it, and going back to my childhood, I, I showed you that picture. I'm like, man, bro, like we were poor, like literally yeah. that's a picture of my sister and I on Christmas with like one thing, like we were happy about that. I'm ha like, I'm happy. That's great. Yeah. I was, look, we had cereal, we had milk. Some kids don't even have that. So I'm happy for that. But we are cold. Man. <laughs> I mean, that's like that right there is our gifts. Like the at the bottom right hand corner, I think is like our our Christmas bags. Like that's it, yeah. man. We Looks got like, like you one got some little cereal thing. there too. Did you guys yeah, get cereal and, for for a yeah. gift, or was that just yeah. like breakfast? <laughs> no, no. I, I think it, I think that was breakfast. But you know, we were appreciative, and like I said, it, yeah. it humbled us because it was like we saw how hard my mom worked. And but the the, the bottom the bottom line would be that. I wasn't privileged because mm -hmm. of my white skin and yet, and, and dude, like that was 1994, 1995. I think that picture was 95 or so. Wow. Like it's now 2020, like things have changed for the better. Like, I don't know. I don't think that we're a broadly racist country. I don't think that, you know, because of my skin color, I'm any better or worse or privileged or less privileged or whatever. Yeah. But I saw, I started seeing all these people talk about white privilege and, and talk about all these different things. And so what did I do? Well, it's COVID, right? And so because of that, a lot of churches are shut down. So what am I left with? Well, I can text friends, I can talk to the various people. But at the same time, you know, churches are shut down, you know, it's not like I can just go to church and say, Hey, hey, brother, you know, what do you think about this? Like, what, what's what's going on with this? Like, you know, everybody's like, hey, let's let's social distance and let's keep our distance and that sort of a thing. And so what did I do? I, I got online and I started I started getting on YouTube, frankly, and, and I started looking at Matt Chandler, I started looking at David Platt, I'm like, well, these guys, like, these guys were solid, like, I started reading articles from the Gospel Coalition and like, all these, you know, these, these organizations and these people that I thought were pretty solid. And they started saying things like, as a white guy, I'm part of the problem because I'm mm. white, I'm sinful. And I'm like, whoa, what, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> yeah, what you know, changed? Yeah, what are you sure. talking about? Right. Like what changed? Like what on earth are you talking about? You know? And so um, that's when I started look again. I, I, I think I first came across A.D. Robles. I think I came across his YouTube channel and he was speaking Bible and he was speaking the truth and love Ephesians 4 15. And he was like, look, I, I don't, I don't know. Now, if you watch some of his earlier stuff, he was a lot more like, I think now he might be a little bit, because I think now it's, it's, you should be, I think, a little bit more tougher now. But mm. back in those days, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we wanted to give the benefit of the doubt because, you know, we have, we were used to the David Platts. We were used to the Matt Chandlers being solid, um, the Gospel Coalition and that sort of thing. But now all of a sudden it was like, what happened to these guys? What changed? And so, you know, I came across A.D. Robas and he was saying a lot of the same things that I was thinking. I was like, man, am I crazy? Um, I remember writing a Facebook post and this was back when um, you could write Facebook notes, actually. I, you, you can't do a Facebook note anymore, but um, I, I think for a post, it had to be a certain amount of characters and then you, you couldn't post it um, or you can do a Facebook note. So I, I wrote this long winded Facebook note saying, hey, here's what the Bible says. Here's what all these people are saying. I'm hearing and I'm seeing a lot of people that I did ministry with, prison ministry. I did children's ministry. I, I know these people to be missionaries that would go overseas and minister to all sorts of different colors, skin color people. 
they don't care about skin color. They care about the gospel. They care about truth. They care about Jesus. They care about the Bible. And yet all of a sudden, a lot of these people are saying, oh, woe is me. I'm a white person. I'm guilty because I'm white. I'm Mm -hmm. privileged because I'm white. I'm sinful because of my skin color because I'm white. And it's just such a saturated with racism society, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, hey, you know, and so I, I really think that in God's providence, I believe that, you know, I was I was in I had like the perfect atmosphere, so to speak, for me to um, get on YouTube and say, OK, here's my thoughts. Here's what I think about these things. Here's what the Bible says, because secretly I got uh, I, I mentioned I posted a, a Facebook note and I was basically saying, here's what the Bible says. Here's what these people are saying they're off why are they being unbiblical and i got a whole bunch of people that were like secretly sending me messages on facebook saying hey i 100 percent, i agree with you i don't know what's going on but something's definitely going on you're right because you're saying what the bible's saying but then excuse me that was secretly like I would get a couple of, I got some pushback from some people that were like, well, who are you to say something about David Plow? Who do you think you are? That's yeah. unbiblical. <laughs> How dare you say unbiblical, you know, and that sort of a thing. And so, you know, I, I, I knew then and there that, you know, hey, this this is a, a golden opportunity for me to speak the truth in love and do the best I can to make much of Christ and not skin color, um, to make much of what God says in his word, the Bible. And so what I did is I was like, you know what? Um, you know, I'm so thankful for the guys like A.D. Robles. I'm so thankful for guys like John Harris at Conversations That Matter. Um, I'm so thankful for guys like Richard Henry at Richard Contramundum and, and that sort of thing, you know? And, and so because if it weren't for those guys, I might be like, hey, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's yeah. just me. Maybe I'm crazy. No, you that's know? true. And so I started the YouTube channel and my goal was to speak the truth in love. Uh, The first year of this YouTube channel, I read through the entire Bible. I figured, hey, you know what I'll do? I want to make this about the Bible. I want to be biblical. That's my main goal. And so what better better way to do that than to read through the Bible? That's that's been my general practice anyway. So I might as well just read it now. (laughs) There are so many apps that read it a lot better than I do. So I'm not recommending anybody listen to me read it, but that's all I did for the first year. I I basically every week I would have one day where there would be a quote unquote review day and I would review what we read throughout the week. And every other day I read through that day's Bible reading. And that's what I did the first year of this YouTube channel. And I made various uh, YouTube videos here and there. um, While homeschooling my kids and, and that sort of a thing. And so, uh, by God's grace, I have a channel and uh, definitely check me out. Uh, I, I do yeah. the best I can to speak the truth in love because it matters. And these these issues matter. And people right. need to understand that they're not alone, um, that there are committed Christ followers that really do want to speak the truth in love as best they can. None of us do this perfectly. That's why we need grace. Um, you know, I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by God. I'm saved by God's grace. And so that's what I want to do. And, and, you know, so that's, that's the goal of the channel and that's where we are today. Yeah, That's my long winded, my, my bullet points. (laughs) No, I appreciate you sharing for sure. I mean, again, we all have different stories and we all have different, uh, you know, it's, we have, sometimes we go back and forth with like, well, you know, experience is all that matters. And some people say, well, experience doesn't matter at all, you know, and, and it's like, well, yes and no to both of those things, because ultimately our experience is like you are who you are because of the crazy wickedness of your dad. Right. And just like the, the and just the heinousness of losing a sibling, your mom and losing a child and just all that stuff. And then being in the military and growing up where you grew up and me growing up where I grew up and having my parents and having one sibling and, you know, and all these other things and everybody else listening and watching, you know, you have a story. I have a story. The listener has a story. Uh, but what that doesn't mean is it makes us who we are, but that also shows us that God does, you know, as the adage goes, meets us where we are, not where we should be. You know, like nobody should ever get divorced. Nobody should ever have an abortion. Nobody should ever commit adultery. Nobody should ever sin, right? But we do sin and we live in a sinful world. We are sinners um, and therefore things happen, you know, and therefore you have to remedy that in one way or the other. And, you know, what we can't do and shouldn't do is have people say my experience 
trumps your experience or my experience goes over against the Bible. I know what that scripture says and history says this and that's what the tradition of the church has said. However, my experience now means this. I feel this way, therefore I am. And I think that's where a lot of people are like, oh, experiences, they don't matter at all. It's like, no, of course they matter, but they don't, they're not a new set of truth. All that is is just Gnosticism and, you know, mystical uh, Eastern ideologies and all sorts of other craziness that, you know, new truth comes in. So, again, I appreciate you sharing, making, making much of Christ. That's something I know uh, you say that often, and uh, I might just uh, steal that more and more because that really is my goal as well. And I hope, you know, again, this was helpful for the listener. Uh, so yeah, check out Will's channel, uh, The Bottom Line Dad. He's on YouTube. He's on all the socials as well, so you can follow him there. Uh, but predominantly on YouTube, producing tons and tons of content. And um, yeah, you got anything last thing to say? No, I just want to say I Ed Littened that from Jason Whitaker oh, <laughs> from snap. Dear World Christians. So I don't want to come. I don't <laughs> want to pretend like I. I guess if I actually technically Ed Littened it, I would not give him credit. That's you so wouldn't awful. Give how. Credit, that's right. That's right. So Ed Litton has become a verb. So, you know, that's that's, that's so crazy. But uh, yeah, I, I'm going to Litton the phrase Litton. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I actually oh, got that from uh, Jason Dr. Whitaker. Ed. But yeah, that's that's the goal of the channel. And um, I appreciate channels like yours, like I said, that do their best to speak the truth in love. Ephesians 415 and uh, yeah. what is it? First Corinthians 13, six, the love chapter, you know, love yep. rejoices in the truth. And so that's, that's our goal. I, I think, uh, you know, you said it best when, you know, the name of your channel is against the world for the sake of the world, right? Richard. Uh, pro mundo, uh, pro mundo, right? Uh, so you're, you're against the world, but for the sake of the world, you want to tell them the truth, um, in love. So that's, that's my goal. And, and I definitely appreciate anybody who tries to do that as well. Yeah, bro. Well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, hope everybody found this helpful and, uh, yeah, check out Will's channel. But we'll see you next time. All right. God bless.